My name is Dan Bannock, and I have the pleasure of chairing what I think is going to be the most exciting panel in the whole conference, and that says quite a lot because this conference has been so wonderful. We are, I'm from the University of Oslo, and, and uh, we have a fantastic panel. We have uh, two presenters here, one discussant, physical, physically present, and one online. The, uh, the topic today is looking at state capacity, how state capacity and the nature of social contracts determine the evolution of taxation um, uh, capacity, taxation states. And a, it's sort of a brief, I'm a political scientist, and you know, t uh, when we think about capacity or state capacity, we often think a little bit about simply the ability to get things done. And we think about many sort of variables like uh, it could be organizational cultures, it could be um, resources, the ability of the state to actually hire civil servants based on merit, to insulate them from social pressures, um, the legitimacy of the state in the eyes of the citizens. All of these things are important in terms of understanding the ability to get things done. And there's also quite a lot of literature about you know, the distinction between the scope of states and the strength of states, right? So scope as in the range of international and domestic functions that the state is supposed to perform, and strength as in the, the effective implementation capacity. And sometimes you have states that are very extensive in scope, but damagingly weak in terms of strength, particularly when there's a lot of corruption and, and patronage. Now, there are so many wonderful sessions here on state capacity, on fiscal capacity, and we have three really, really good papers that, that further sort of nuance this perspective between looking at state capacity and the ability to generate more revenue. So one of the uh, papers, uh, and I'm not going to mention which paper, et cetera, but I was just thinking, highlighting three aspects. One has to do with trying to identify the institutional factors that determine state capacity. And here, of course, the equal sort of allocation of resources. If citizens receive resources and they perceive this to be fair, then state capacity increases. Correspondingly, if there's corruption, then you don't really want to pay taxes. But in, in this sort of uh, new cycle of doom and gloom, there's actually a lot of optimism out there. And in one of the papers you will, and in the presentations, you will hear that since the 1990s, uh, the capacity to, to tax or taxation capacity has actually increased in many low-income countries, which is really a positive thing. The second uh, point here has to do with looking at a, a, a related aspect, of course, of state capacity, but that is often termed as information capacity. So the ability of the state to know if obviously if, if the state has good accurate information about its citizens, about the economy, um, about different types of economic activities, then the ability to tax of course increases. On a side note, I just we received my wife and I yesterday a, a letter from the Norwegian uh, Department of uh, Motor Vehicles. Our oldest son is turning 18. So and I was a little worried because we got two letters, my wife and I, from the same authority. I thought I'd, I hadn't paid any, you know, some tax or something, road tax. It turned out the state knows too much about me and my family, information capacity. It was a very nice message saying, your son is eligible for a driver's license. You know, you're welcome to this uh, little meeting and we can help you and provide you with more information about how a good a driver, a safe driver he can be. I, I was a bit blown away with this. It's like I feel that the Norwegian state knows too much about me. And anyway, for information capacity is, is, is important. And finally, of course, we think about state capacity as in you know, the Weberian state, the role of the bureaucracy, effective implementation, recruitment, all of that. It turns out social networks are also very important. And in one of the presentations, you will hear about how the state can use dense social networks for good purposes, but also for very bad purposes. So state capacity linked to, to uh, social networks. So we have this fantastic panel. Uh, we have somebody online uh, at 2 o'clock in the morning, I think in Boston, Leander Heldring from N Northwestern University. Good morning, uh, Leander. So I'm going to be very kind and let you start first. but. 
Let me just also introduce uh, Matthias uh, Vom Hau from the Barcelona Institute of International Studies, Oliver Morrissey from the University of Nottingham, and then we have UNU Wider's very own Rachel Gisselquist, who's going to be the, the uh, discussant. I have uh, informed the panel, 15 minutes uh, each, around 15, and then around 12 minutes for Rachel. And then we'll take questions from the online audience and then people in the room. Please use the hashtag on Twitter, Rev4Dev, R-E-V-4Dev, if you want to uh, tweet. And otherwise, um, welcome to the session. And Leander, it's over to you. Great. So uh, thanks to the organizers to, for giving me the opportunity to do this online. Um, I want to talk to you today about Rwanda. And I'm going to present a brief version of this paper that I wrote with my colleague James Robinson on state capacity in Rwanda. And I'm going to try and go a little bit quick because we have 15 minutes. So it's not a surprise to anyone in this conference that there is some consensus around uh, the fact that some of the problems of development and fragility in Africa are due to the weak state. In fact, it's one of the reasons why we have this conference. And this consensus is bolstered with many disparate pieces of evidence across the social sciences. So whichever science you're in, I'm sure you have some strand of evidence in your field of study that tells us something like this. Here's a, here's a picture I like. This is the PK market in Bangui in, in the Central African Republic. And Louise Lombard in her very interesting ethnography of the Central African Republic and state says that this is effectively where the state stops. This is 12 kilometers away from the presidential palace, just as an illustration. Now, the sort of the intellectual tradition behind of this, behind this is that we all start from Weber's distinction between the rational legal and the patrimonial state. We also know all of this. So the African state is thought to be patrimonial. So the way to do better is to move from being patrimonial to being rational, legal. Now, what we do in our paper is to question this consensus. And we have three claims that I want to bring across today. So our first claim is that in Rwanda, which is you know, the focus of our study, that the state looks quite weak on Weberian criteria. So just to give an example, taxes raised as a percentage of GDP are very low. But in fact, it has a great deal of observed capacity. Now, we talk in the paper quite a bit about the terrible genocide that happened there, where it was very perversely evident that the state implemented this immense plan, which killed around 800,000 people in three months, which had not been possible had it not had tremendous control over society. Much more positively, we also documented in the growth miracle, subsequent growth miracle that Rwanda is going through now, the state is very intimately involved in many aspects of um, economic life in sectors that are central to this miracle, most centrally agriculture. And we asked the question, how? So our second claim that we make is that the key to understand this is that the Rwandan state basically as at its edges blurs into society. So the state is very densely connected to society at a local level. Bureaucrats are not really bureaucrats. They have jobs, they're unpaid, but they're part of the state hierarchy. They work for the government a couple hours a week, a couple hours a day. So you don't see them on the budgets, you don't see them on the books, but they are very clearly advancing state objectives. Now, such sort of networks between state and society have, of course, been widely pointed out by Africanist political scientists, sociologists, economists. They have typically been interpreted as purely patrimonial and redistributed. So these are avenues for people to extract favors from the state. We argue conversely that this has also been an avenue for the state to implement policy. And this can be very bad like in the genocide, or it can be very good, like during the uh, recent growth miracle. Now, we have a long section in the paper, and I think this is part of the, you know, part of the interest of the paper, and it um, links up with some of the sessions in the conference, that this capacity is historically constituted. 
So I'm going to skip over that now in the, in, in the interest of time. Um, but the one point I will make about it is that because this type of capacity is historically constituted, it is not sort of the general purpose ability to get things done. Because you're tapping into social networks, you're tying into society, the scope of the things you can get done through sort of networked state capacity are more limited than you can get done through Weberian or sort of more formal state capacity. So this limits what the Rwandan state can do today. And you know, I'd love to talk to about that with anyone who's have a lot of thoughts on that. But what I would like to do is talk a little bit about like real data and real empirics, because we're social scientists after all. I want you to keep in mind two samples, two empirical samples. One is a sample of communes, 142 communes in Rwanda. What we're going to try and do is relate the Weberian state to a measure of the networked state. And what I'm going to try and do is show that these are uncorrelated. The second thing I'm going to try and do is show you a sample of Rwandans in a lab in the field experiment I implemented some years ago in 21 villages close to, but on either side of an expanding, of the border of an expanding historical state. So the idea is that network state capacity being historically constituted varies with exposure to the historical state. So this is how we're going to measure the net network capacity. And what we're going to try and do is show you that, first of all, this capacity is of orthogonal to Weberian capacity, and then that it does correlate with outcomes we care about. So let me do the first thing. This is the expansion of the historical state in Rwanda. So darker shaded areas of this map are areas where the state expanded into earlier. And what we're going to try and do is relate this variation to outcomes we care about. This is the second sample. The right part of this map, the gray outlines are also in injected into the left map in black outlines. The blue line is a river where the expansion of the state stopped for some time. The little black outlines are villages in which we implemented the lab in the field exercise with 20 persons per village. I'll tell you exactly what we did. So how we're going to measure the Weberian state. So at the countrywide commune level, we have various regular measures of so taxes, revenue, several measures of presence of so the infrastructural capacity, schools, hospitals, etc. In the fieldwork villages, we did a more detailed survey. So we know whether there's a government office, a police station, we know corruption, we know bureaucratic responsiveness. So, and what we're going to do in the commune samples, we're going to regress the bearing state capacity on sort of network informal capacity in the sample from our fieldwork exercise we're going to um, focus on whether a participant is inclined to follow an unenforced rule and so this is a very important part of the modern state that we sort of get buy-in of individuals even when we don't stand next to them controlling every move so i measure that in a few word exercise. And what we're going to try and do is regress this on both a measure of network capacity and modern Weberian capacity in a horse race. So this is a dense table, um, but the way it's structured is that there is four panels and each panel has three or four columns and there are different categories of the presence of the Weberian state. So we measure all of this just before the genocide, so not to have that contaminate our outcomes. So the first panel is about taxes. So we have taxes received per capita, trade taxes, other taxes. Then the second panel is expenditure. Then we have various panels that measure sort of infrastructural presence, like various public services, energy, water, 
then cooling at the bottom, we have hospitals, social centers, other things like that, and then agricultural cooperative markets, trade, commercial centers, etc. The point here is that across all of these measures, there is basically no association with what here is in the table is called state presence, which is our measure of the density of penetration of these networked relationships between state and society. Now, just as an interlude, for some measures, you can push these results back in time. So you can measure schools in 1960 um, and missionary schools in 24, 35 and hospitals going back in time. And there's no relationship at all between um, those outcomes, so the Weberian state outcomes, and the presence of the state historically. Now we're switching gears into the fieldwork sample. So here the unit of observation is no longer a commune, but it's an individual. And on the left hand side, so the dependent variable, is a measure of compliance with the rule. And the first row you see here is our measure of networked state capacity. And then columns include different measures of the Weberian state. And so what we see is that people's tendency to comply with the rules today correlates with how strongly historically their communities were connected with the state. And not so much whether the state today sets up an office or is more or less corrupt. Okay, so I'm going very quickly. But these results are consistent with the idea that state capacity is multidimensional. So it's no, not just the case that being stronger connected to network or the capacity of the Weberian state. No, this is an orthogonal dimension of the more broader idea of the capacity of the state to get things done. So is it the case that the network state is uniquely associated with bad outcomes? No, absolutely not. Let me, let me show you. The center graph here is from some earlier work I did, where we, on the x-axis we have the same measure, network state capacity, y-axis is violence in the genocide. During the genocide, the network state is positively correlated with violence in the genocide. Before and after, these are the other two graphs, the opposite relationship is true. So the network state is associated with less violence. So it really depends on the policies that the state are pursuing, how this type of capacity plays out on outcomes. So I think I may be moving to the end of my time. Let me say one, one last thing, which is that we have a large section in the paper where we then push the argument to the modern Rwandan growth miracle. So it's very clear that the Rwandan state tries to, in a very micro level, target and um, push around economic activity by ordinary Rwandans. And it does this despite not formally employing that many people and despite still having tax revenues relative to GDP that are below what the IMF calls a viable level for running a government. And we argue again that this is done by people that are informally employed by the government but are in a network structure with the central state in Kigali. Okay, so we make three claims in this paper. First, even though Rwandan, the Rwandan state looks weak on observed Weberian criteria, it has a great deal of capacity. The second is that the key to understand this is then dense links between the state and society. The boundaries blurred. The third claim is that you, this is not a general purpose technology like Weberian state capacity might be because you socially interact with people in society. What you can get done is circumscribed by a social contract. So I didn't get much time to talk about that, but perhaps in the discussion we'll have time to talk. Thanks very much.